All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. Today, we are talking about legacy in a family business. Now, I am someone who has worked within someone else's family business and had a absolutely turbulent experience. And I'm also someone as a coach who has worked with many family businesses and helped them really find their path to how they want to be a business while also maintaining a family feel. I find it to be a really fascinating topic. And today we've got someone who I believe is going to be able to speak to it very well. Giancarlo, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Aram. I really appreciate the chance to be here today. Okay, awesome. All right. So what I want to start out with is we'd love to hear about you and then also the company that, that you're heading up. So you can take us anywhere. You can start at the beginning of your career. You can start with you now, whatever works for you, and then tell us the story of the company. Great. Uh... So I am the president of a company called QTG. Uh, it's funny how uh, when you asked me to tell about myself, I immediately wanted to go more towards uh, the professional side of, uh, of who I am and what I do. Um, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit also of how I ended up uh, as president of a fourth generation family business. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are a company that fabricates products, uh, finished products, semi-finished products uh, out of tubular steel. Uh, the company is 91 years old, and uh, I am proud to be the fourth generation here. And, and I'm also uh, in the process of managing a major investment project that's going to take us in a new direction and, and hopefully position us for future success. Wow, that's awesome. All right. I have so many questions to ask you about this, especially with a legacy company like that. Let's talk about the, the company history. Uh, so yeah, so my great grandfather and his brother started the company back in 1929. Uh, they opened up a small tinsmithing company to make products for the maple syrup industry here in Quebec, and and so they got started making little buckets and nails and and, uh, and that kind of stuff out of tin. Uh, my grandfather then uh, took the business and started doing hot dip galvanizing, which was uh, one of the processes that we. Uh, we're doing with the uh, the tinsmithing side of the business. Throughout the years, the company evolved to uh, inherit actually some of the assets of a few clients that had gone bankrupt. They had bought a couple of companies as well in the fencing industry because one of the biggest consumers of hot dip galvanizing was uh, the the chain link fence that you would see just about everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and my grandfather grew that company. Uh, my father then in 1982 bought a tube mill. Uh, because we were having a hard time getting steel tubing for the fence posts that we were installing. And then in 1982, uh, that kind of took off. And, and from there, the tube mill became the main business until in 99, the galvanizing plant was sold off. Commodity steel tubing sold through distribution was, uh, was the business. And in 2015, um, I started working on a transition plan with my father to take the company more towards value-added manufacturing, and, and that's where we're headed today. All right on. Okay. So I'm fascinated here. Was it always your plan to join the business, or did it just kind of you know, happen in your life? Uh, no, it was actually never part of the plan to uh, <laughs> move back to Montreal. My family had moved uh, down to the States. I actually grew up in Vermont and then spent most of my adolescence in Boston. I went to high school and university down in Boston. Uh, the company it was in Montreal. Uh, it was always an option to come back and work in the family business. I'd actually even spent one summer up in Montreal just to, to kind of check it out and see what it was all about. But honestly, I had no real interest in doing that. I kind of thought that I would be... Uh, headed more towards something creative. I studied business in school, but it, I really had no idea what that meant uh, and where I was trying to go with it. Um, and it wasn't really until graduation when I realized I didn't have a better plan that I, I said, you know what, maybe this is uh, something that, that would be interesting for me. Um, and I took a chance and I love Montreal. So I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to at least be in a city that I love. And I'm going to go back and, uh, and see what the business is all about. Cool, man. Okay, so would it surprise you that many of the presidents and CEOs and C-suites of legacy family companies that I work with, almost every single person I work with said, I actually never intended to join the, the family business. Almost every single one of them. 
I, yeah, you know, I, I can imagine that it's, um, it's so omnipresent, you know, that the business is just part of the conversation growing up. And so there was no allure there. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how to describe it, but it, it always seemed like, um, almost more of a safety net than anything else. And, mm. uh, and so in my own experience, I found that it didn't really excite me, uh, in the way that kind of staking out on my own and, uh, and making my own name, uh, doing my own thing. Um, it, it, it didn't really excite me in that way, but at the same time, you know, I'd seen how good the company had been to our family over the years. And I had an opportunity, you know, I, I talked with my father and before making the decision to move back up to Montreal about what my role could be there. And, and it was really clear that I would have an opportunity to do and see and participate in things in business at a level that, you know, I was at 23 years old, I had my, my education, but I was going to be able to get my hands in whatever I wanted to up there. And, and uh, that was an opportunity that I thought was a little too good to pass up. Uh, to be able to to learn from the people who are running the day to day of the business up in Montreal and and uh, get to see things that I don't think that somebody at my age or with my experience would have really had a chance to do for uh, for years. Mm, totally. Okay. So there's a huge bonus, um, like a huge upside to being able to work in a family business, a legacy business that's been around for almost a hundred years. You are able to get involved in things, kind of like, you know, get into the business in a way that someone with your level of education or experience might not have been able to at your age. What's the downside of it? So (laughs) So, you go into the business, you're someone who's fresh out of school, you're clearly a family member stepping into the business. What was the downside? So I had two major downsides and they went hand in hand uh, because you know, my family had moved away. My father hadn't really worked in the office uh, since the early 90s. Uh, it was 2008 when I finished university. Um, he was very involved as, a, as the owner of the business, but not so much on an operational level. And we had a professional manager who was there running the day-to-day of the business. But like I said, my father never really planned on his children, you know, I have a, an older sister and a younger brother uh, taking an interest and in moving back to Quebec and uh, and working in the the business. So it wasn't built for us. The the business was really designed to uh, run on its own, mm-hmm. and it was kind of hard to see where my place would be in the organization, except as an apprentice. You know, I was there to learn, and and I was okay with that. So you know, the the, the president of the company had always said, uh, whenever you're ready, come on up. I'll uh, show you the ropes. My first day of work was September 1st, 2008. Um, I think the wheels fell off the global economy about a week later. And (laughs) the president of the company quit about a month and a half after that. No. Uh, for really reasons that may or may not have been really related to my arrival. I think there was, uh, basically a sense for her that my arrival kind of signaled that there would be a next generation there. And, you know, she was at the point in her career where she said, hey, if I'm going to do something else, then now's probably the time. And, uh, you know, it was a cash cow and the business was quiet and on wheels and things were going well. And uh, the team who I inherited there had all been working in the company for 30 years. Um, They were not really too interested in my arrival. <laughs> um, I really was met more with indifference than anything else. And, you know, I was 23. I didn't speak a word of French. Um, coming into an organization that was almost exclusively uh, unilingual French. Mm-hmm. And so I had a really hard time trying to figure out how I could be of value in, in that uh, organization. At the same time, I've got you know, now a role where the president of the company has left. Mm -hmm. My family lives down in the States. My father wasn't really interested in coming back. And so he said, hey, you know what? You're there. Learn. Make your mistakes. Don't make the same ones twice. And I'm here when you need me. And uh, and off I went. (laughs) So it was uh, a trial by fire. And I think that that was really difficult for me in retrospect to figure out even where to start. You know, I didn't even have the work history to understand how to work, never mind to understand 
what kind of work I was supposed to be doing. So how did you figure that out, man? Uh, it took a long time. And I think that part of it was um, getting out of the office. Uh, I worked for a little while there, uh, kind of floating around from department to department, trying to see what stuck. And I realized that, you know, I was not really interested in being in the office where, you know, it was a very quiet place. People worked with their doors closed. Um, you know, again, a team that had worked together for so long that it was a lot of, of routine and, you know, the place was empty at 4.59 every evening. And, uh, that was just the, the, the environment of the place. And so I said, Hey, you know, I can do sales and we have clients across Canada who speak English. And, and so I left and I lived in hotels for about four years and, uh, learned the ropes doing outside sales. Mm -hmm. Um, and we ended up actually, uh, deciding to bring in a, another manager to give me some more time to develop. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and then it wasn't until really, uh, five, six years after my, I had first arrived full time at the company that I thought that I was ready to kind of come back into the office and, and take more of a management role. Okay. What did that do to your psychology? So you go up, you start, president quits, you've got this path that's laid out in front of you, but it was hard. You had people who weren't necessarily interested in you showing up. You didn't know what your place was. From a psychological point of view, how did that impact you? I think that I really struggled to develop the confidence that I could make an impact. And I was almost jealous to some degree of some of my friends who maybe had more of a traditional uh, work experience where you get hired, you have a manager, the manager teaches you how to replace them, they move up when the guy above them or the woman above them retires. And and you have this career path that's a little bit more linear, a lot more training in place. Um, I don't think at 23, I had the maturity either to do that on my own. I know that some people do. Mm -hmm. uh, in my own circumstance, I, I was uh, I was lost. And, and uh, I think that it took a long time for me to feel like, I could really have a positive impact. I felt powerless, and, and uh, which is so strange because you know I'm, I'm there as a representative of the owner. I'm a family member. I'm the president of the organization, and I, and I didn't feel empowered to change the place to be what I thought it needed to be. Hmm. And what did you do? to challenge that? What did you do to break past that, to get past that barrier? It really took, uh, it was really the point when I started to look around the office and realize that the team I had at the business was not the team that was going to carry the business into the future. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of key people who were at a point in their career where they were getting ready to retire. Uh, I had to make some decisions about who was going to be coming in to replace those people and what kind of culture I wanted to build and, and what were the talents I was going to be looking for in those people? Uh, what did I value in the environment that I wanted to create? I wanted to build a place that I wanted to go to work. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, I felt that when I got to the point where I was comfortable enough to say, hey, it's not working with the, the team that we have here. Uh, that was the point where I really started to feel empowered to uh, make the changes that I thought I needed to make. And uh, I think another important part for me of the, the human resources journey that I, I had to take was the confidence to say, you know, I don't need to know how to be an accountant to know that I need a great accountant. I don't need to know how to be a production manager to know that I need a production manager. I need to understand how to motivate and measure these people. I need to know, understand how to uh, set clear goals, how, create a vision for where I would like the company to be, uh, and then find the people who have the skills to, to get us there. Um, and that for me was a, a big step, I think, in, in my development as a leader. Yeah, I, I have a, a firm believer that uh, in the senior levels of an organization, especially at a CEO level, uh, or in that uh, that space, um, a great leader doesn't need to be an expert 
in all the different parts of the business. A great leader needs to be an expert in people and how to bring the right kinds of people together and allow them to lead. Create a, a vision and um, a real team environment that allows people to be the experts and to push forward. So it sounds like what you, that's what you focused on. Yeah, and, and I think that's still a transition that I'm, I'm going through now is, is transitioning out of a more operational mindset into one of uh, being more of a, use the word visionary, but you know, the person responsible for uh, creating the strategic vision for the company and, and making sure that that's clearly communicated and, and building the team that is going to help us to deliver that and making sure that the mission's clear and, and the values of who we are as a company are clear uh, mm -hmm. so that everyone's kind of rowing in the, in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So what I hear in your story as you're telling it, some moments of profound fear and some moments of possibly feeling like, do I have a place here? Like, am I an imposter? So how did you push through those to find courage? Because you talked about courage earlier, and it sounds like it was like there was a time where you started to really come into your own for feeling a bit more courageous. So how did you push through that fear and that insecurity? Yeah, that's a, a really great question because I'm still terrified of a lot of the stuff that I have to do. I think that it's just yeah. that the mindset changed of going, yeah, be terrified, do it anyways. Um, yeah. and, and being able to uh, have the self-confidence that um, whether it's uh, perfect or whether it is a giant disaster, you know, inaction is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you learn along the way, and and so for me, I've had the uh, good fortune of of being able to navigate some real heavy decisions about um, about the company, and and uh, you know one of the most challenging experiences of my professional life was uh, back in 2015 when I was you know kind of at the point with my father because you know he was less interested in uh, the operational side of the business than ever and um, wanted to uh, validate my interest in sticking around for the long haul uh, so that he could understand what, you know, his plan needed to be. And uh, so I kind of got to that point where it was like, hey, man, you need to make a decision. Are you in or are you out? And it took getting to that point to to understand my responsibility. And, and the answer that I came up with was, I don't want to work in the company as it is. That doesn't mean that I don't want to be here. It just means that things can't continue the way that they are. And, you know, we had a lot of employees who were, um, I want to say unhappy is not the right word, but there was certainly no sense, no sense of camaraderie, uh, even though we were very fortunate to count most of our employees as, as lifelong uh, employees. So, you know, we were doing mm -hmm. something right. But at the same time, I could tell that there was just a real lack of uh, vision for where this whole thing was going. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to make some tough decisions. And one of those decisions was to uh, start this transition towards markets that had a lot more potential. And in order to do that, I had to, in one week, let go 35 people who had uh, worked at the company for some of them longer than I'd been alive. Wow. And I learned a really important lesson about the responsibility that I have as the president and as the owner of the, the business to the people who work uh, as employees uh, of our family. Um, I felt like I hadn't done enough. I don't, don't feel like I had put in all of the effort that I was capable of putting in. And I was then confronted with the reality that I wasn't the one who was suffering the consequences of that. And so I really learned a harsh lesson about uh, what my role is in the company. And, uh, and I've taken that to heart and I've carried that with me as, uh, as we've grown. And, and fortunately, we've been able to hire back uh, the equal number of people who we had, uh, had let go. And I really 
take great pride in, in being an employer. It's something I think is uh, is one of the most fulfilling parts of my job. And that's something that uh, that I think comes from those experiences of, of having to go through right sizing a business and, and feeling responsible for that. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the transformation you're taking the organization through. And, and I, I'm really interested about what it's like to kind of center yourself in all of this legacy and then change direction. But before we get into that, through all of this stuff that you've experienced so far, what is something that you've learned about yourself that surprises you? I've really learned a lot about myself uh, over the last 12 years. And I think one of the things that I've learned that's uh, the most important to me is that I love learning. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) and so that's that's a a process that is continual. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a jack of all trades. I'm somebody who is not very technical, uh, Mm -hmm. but I love being a generalist. I love uh, being involved in, in anything I can get my hands on. I I like to learn, you know, what makes people tick. I love learning, you know, the production side of the business. I love learning the, uh, the nuts and bolts of, you know, the accounting and finance side of it. Um, but I think part of that for me is just this desire to keep getting better as a leader and as a person. And, and, and yeah, I've got a, a real curiosity, not only in my, in my professional life, but in my my personal life as well. I have a ton of hobbies and uh, I'm not really great at any of them, but I love doing just about uh, <laughs> just about anything you can think of from, you know, playing guitar to playing soccer to uh, brewing my own beer at home or whatever it is, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot and, uh, uh, and try and learn something new every day. I love it, man. All right. Let's talk about this, uh, this real, you know, journey that, the organization is started in, in 2020. So after 91 years, uh, there's a huge shift in the organization, even a shift into, into what the organization is called. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny because, uh, you know, thinking back, uh, you know, on the legacy of the company, the legacy has been transformation. And I, and I really think that that's uh, one of the reasons why we are still here after 91 years. Um, there's not a, an emotional attachment to what we do. Uh, there is a real open spirit to change and grow and, and do things differently. Uh, and I think that that's really been the case uh, since the beginning. You know, my grandfather going into the hot dip galvanizing, my father getting into tubing, and, and now for myself, you know, headed more towards value-added manufacturing, contract manufacturing. Um, it's an evolution. Uh, it's not a revolution. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a a clear path that we have been following and, and, you know, it seems, yeah, like it, 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 it's all happening overnight, but this is a process that I've been working on for five years now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, the, the overnight success is never, never really overnight. And, um, I think one of the areas that I'm working on as well is is really making sure that I can communicate that vision to the rest of the organization is often what's clear in my head is not clear for everybody else. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a it's a huge challenge to make sure everybody understands, you know, the vision for for where we're trying to go. Um and that lets everybody buy in and, and feel like, you know, their work is contributing to something and, and to feel empowered with uh with what they're doing at work every day. Okay. Um so if you're going through this time of change and, you know, it's like you said, something that might seem like it happened overnight, actually, you've been working on for years and years. But as you're working towards change, what kind of level of fear do you have around tarnishing what has been? You know, when you have this like incredible legacy, this company has been around for so long. And you said, you know, like it's never been about what we do. It's about our ability to kind of like take on new things and evolve and grow. What kind of level of fear do you have about tarnishing that that rich tradition? I think I put way more pressure on myself than uh, my father has ever put on on any of his children to uh, be or do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a real deep respect for the uh, the fact that you know we are a company that has survived this long. It's really rare in business for companies to survive one transition, never mind 
uh, three and, and to, to have a fourth generation there, it's not something that happens often. And I think that um, I'm really proud of that. You know, that, that's something that for me, I'm, I, I look at and say, yeah, like this is a, a really cool history. Um, but it's not something that I think we get caught up on. You know, my grandfather, unfortunately, he passed away uh, when I was quite young. Um, so there wasn't a lot of, uh, I, you know, I never talked business with my grandfather. I think when I was maybe five or six years old when he passed. Um, so, you know, what I got, I got from my father and, and my father, like I said, he never really expected that, uh, the company would continue. So, you know, for us, there was never a lot of pressure, um, for, for me or for my siblings, uh, to, uphold a legacy uh the company name even you, you know you mentioned it had changed over the years as well you know we mm. uh had been Talarico limited and bond metal finishers and you know quality galve and quality tube and quality fab and and the qtg uh branding that that we've just gone through was basically just to kind of bring everything under one banner mm. but yeah i don't know it's it's very strange because I, i'm very proud of it but i'm not attached to it uh <laughs> so so yeah I, I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense but uh yeah it makes perfect sense but what are you attached to because you you know you, you've hit on like you know it's not necessarily the name it's not necessarily the legacy but what are you attached to what is the thing that you're like yeah this really matters to me so going back to uh the story of my arrival at the family business uh, i think is an important it's an important part of how I developed some of my own feelings and emotions around working in a family business. And, you know, I think one of the things that's most important for me is uh, feeling like I am responsible for myself and, and, mm -hmm. and being able to take personal uh, responsibility for the successes or failures of the business. And these thoughts of legacy and uh, responsibility and um, I think that this is all wrapped in uh, for me to a sense of really feeling like I've been put in a position of privilege uh, where I have been really set up for success. Uh, you know, I'm also... I want to make sure that, that I am able to take credit for my own successes. I think that that's something where, uh, you know, we've, we're taught to be humble and, and, uh, and to acknowledge that we are privileged uh, in that. And I'm speaking, you know, for, for my siblings. And mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I really have always, I think, wanted to be seen as my own person and mm -hmm. to be uh, independent. And uh, now with my career, I know that that's a real driving force for me as well uh, to want to make my own mark um, that goes beyond what uh, my father and grandfather and great grandfather have uh, have built and, and, and left for us to develop. So earlier I asked you what's something you learned about yourself that you're really like surprised to learn. What's something that you've learned about yourself that you need to still work on? Oh, I know that I need to work on, uh, there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working now on developing some new skills uh, mm -hmm. as I move into the role of the visionary for the company. And I think one of the things that I'm working on right now is learning how to own my my strengths a, a, as well mm -hmm. uh so you know just as an example i remember um when i would hire people when i was quite young you know i'm 25 years old and i would be trying to hire somebody to to come in and, and, and work for me and and i would often give the the little disclaimer that you know that i would go oh, we, well you know i'm only 25 and and uh, I'm trying to bring you in because I need your skills and, and I really, you know, I'm hiring you for your expertise because I don't have that. And I found myself doing that even after, you know, I've been working here for 12 years and, and I have an expertise and I have uh, some strengths. And 
So, uh, yeah, I'm really working on developing that confidence to, to say, you know what, I know some things and, and, uh, and to take responsibility for, uh, for my successes and my failures too. Yeah. Um, there's a marked difference when you talk about the business and you talk about yourself. <laughs> I think it's and, a lot easier to talk about the business than it is to talk yeah, about myself. Um, you speak with so much more comfort when you speak about the business and you talk so much more freely when you talk about the business. And when I ask you about yourself or about your story, it's, um, very inward looking and you're more halting. You're more thoughtful of what you're going to say. And that doesn't mean a bad thing, but I could see the distinct, the distinct difference. So that really brings me to the question of, you know, as being one of the family who has had the opportunity to now uh, lead in this business. How much imposter syndrome have you had to push through? You know, quite a bit. And, and at the same time, um, I think I'm also really good at what I do. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, the, it can be both of those things at the same time for me. And, um, you know, I, I've, I'm really proud of what we're building right now. And, and I think that the work that I've been able to do in this organization over the last few years. And again, you know, this is, I, I'm the same person who I was at, at 23 in some ways and in others, you know, I have all these other experiences and, and I'm much more confident than I was when I first started. And, and mm -hmm. at this point, you know, there's not much that really intimidates me from a, a, a a work perspective, I, I go, you know, I, if I don't know how to do it, I, I know how to find somebody who can. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I definitely have developed a lot of confidence in, in my professional life over the last few years. And, and I think that part of that is just having experience. Um, yeah. so I, I'm really looking forward again, like it, it's looking back at who I was 10 years ago. Um, I'm hopeful that in 10 years from now, I can kind of do the same exercise and look back at, at who I am today and go, Oh, wow. You know, yeah, I learned a whole lot over the last 10 years, but also well, to yeah, feel comfortable where I am now. Well, what I'm finding real interesting about this is you have no problem learning how to do something and you've got the willingness to do that. And I really admire that as someone who is part of a legacy business and a family business, like the willingness to go in, learn it, take the hits, you know, make the tough decisions. Um, from a skill set perspective, I can see like you have no problem learning something. And even if it's learning how to hire someone to do that and getting comfortable with that, where I'm really interested in is the role that like overcompensating from like, you see, I look at things from a skill set and a mindset perspective. And the mindset would be like where you'd be thinking about like confidence and like who you are as a leader and your position. You know, you'd mentioned earlier, like when you were younger, you'd hire people and you'd, you'd kind of sell them this idea. Like, I don't know what I, I don't, I'm not as skilled as you are and experienced as you. And that's why I'm hiring you. But you had to actually like force yourself to let go of saying that at some point, because you're like, I actually do have these skills. <laughs> so that to me is like a, an overcompensation, um, space that I find a lot of leaders in legacy companies have like. I'm a family member here. This person probably thinks I'm some like rich kid who got this job because of whatever. So there's a lot of overcompensating. I'm not suggesting that's the truth for you, but I hear it a little bit in your story. So tell me about that. Like, do you see any history of overcompensation? And if so, have you overcome that or are you overcoming it? I mean, of course. And it would be, in my opinion, totally foolish to say that any other company would have hired me at 23 years old to be their president. That, that, that's just, you know, I, I have to acknowledge that I was in the position I was in because my name was on the side of the building and not because, you know, I had uh, uh, graduated with a, a perfect GPA and, and I was the most qualified candidate for that job. So I don't know. I think it can be both those things where um, on one hand, yeah, like I was coming into a business where people had worked there for a long time and were looking at me as the little prince and, uh, mm -hmm. and then also saying, yeah, but that doesn't mean that I can't do the job. And it doesn't mean that I can't get to that place where um, I'm going to learn what I need to learn uh, to, to be effective here. Mm -hmm. And I think that where that really clicked for me was understanding that I was taking the chair. And, and, and you know, there's only one president of the organization. 
And with a, a, a weak person, whether that was me or somebody else in that position, the company was not going to do what I wanted it to do. Mm-hmm. And there I was blocking the seat. So, you know, it was either going to be me or I was going to leave and hire somebody else. But um, I was in the position and, and and it really like honestly just kind of clicked for me <laughs> one day. And it, and it wasn't, I don't think so much of a... a a gradual process, uh, more as one where I just kind of got it at one point and said, you know what, if this is going to be what I think it has the potential to be, no one else is going to drive it there but me. Mm. Uh, There's no one else who's going to take this as seriously as me. There's no one else who's going to be as invested as me. So either I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it, but I can't blame it on somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that was a, a real key moment in my career where I said, you know, yeah, I, I can do this and, and I'm going to do it. And, uh, and honestly, it just kind of came like that. <laughs> but that's, that's it, man. And that's what I'm, you know, here I'm, I'm pushing you a little bit in this conversation because I can see, because for our audience, I can, we're on video as, uh, as we're speaking. Um, I can see how uncomfortable you are talking about yourself. And I, I really want to say the value proposition for the listener here. And I think also for me, as a guy that's known you for a long time and, and love to see your successes, I think you've learned something about yourself in this process that maybe you weren't hitting on. And that it's that moment of truth. It's like, no, not only can I do this, I am going to do this. And I'm going to do it better than anyone else because I'm in this position. and I have the willingness to walk through the fire on that. And I really encourage you to like own that, man, because like it's a cool part of your story. Well, it it is something, you know, one of the things that I've done recently is hire a CEO coach who's been really helpful. And we've only been working together for a few months and uh, uh, is really challenging me on some of that stuff. And, And I think, too, something that's important for me is to understand how I'm going to apply those skills uh, when I, in order for it to, to really um, hit home for me, I kind of have to understand the application. Mm-hmm. And more recently with uh, some of the investments that we're making, I've been asked to, uh, you know, be quoted for a little article that they're writing up. And, and that's always been such an uncomfortable place for me that um, I have decided that it's something that I want to develop. And, and so I'm pushing myself a little outside of my comfort zone with, with this podcast today. And, and I think yeah. that it's only through those experiences that I'm, I'm going to get more confidence around uh, having those types of conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so strange as well, because I'm not somebody who in my personal life, you would ever think uh, <laughs> has, has issues with, you know, speaking about, uh, about myself, you know, I'd be the first person to get up and sing karaoke or uh, whatever it, you know I'm totally comfortable talking one on one with people um I'm even comfortable speaking in front of a group but it's really that you know the the salesman's instinct doesn't really kick in when it when I'm talking about myself and the way that I can do that when I'm talking about my business or uh any other of those things in my life that I'm I'm really proud and happy to uh to talk about well, and it's such a distinct difference, again, for us, for the audience to know that um, we've known each other for a long time. And um, the difference is stark when I, you know, think of spending time with you, uh, you know, like outside of punk shows versus talking about this. And I also, I can see like the, the connections you're making to, to bringing that strength into your conversation. A lot of it, I think, is probably tied to that whole, you know, I'm part of a legacy family organization. It, there's a sense of like, have I really earned this versus like, was this gifted to me? But also then finding like, no, actually I am earning this and I have earned this and I earn it every single day. And I think that's a, that path towards strength. The thing I got to encourage you is like every space, man, you got to talk about this stuff. Cause you know, when you, <laughs> when you do it, you do it like you're killing it. I'm, I'm really feeling good about it. Um, so I got a couple more questions before we wrap up. Sure. Okay. What's the biggest mistake? that you feel that you've made in this role that you're comfortable talking about? Wow. Uh, I've definitely made more than a few mistakes uh, (laughs) over my career. Um, You know, but often I've been very fortunate that uh, the worst case scenario never really has seemed to present itself uh, as the reality. It's often, you know, I can build things up to be way worse than they are uh, in that moment of panic when you, mm-hmm. you know, when I've done something, for example, like, uh, 
you know, you call and tell a supplier the wrong product and, and it's, you know, a $200,000 order that all of a sudden you're not sure is going to meet the specs for the client or, but I, you know, I think more on a personal level, uh, I just wish that I had known earlier in my career that, that I just needed to act and I needed to, uh, take ownership of uh, where I was at. Um, Mm. and I often confused not being committed uh, with not being hardworking. And I think that one of the things that I wish I had known at a younger age was that, you know, you don't have to be uh, dedicated to spending the rest of your life somewhere to put your whole effort into uh, doing your best work every day. Mm. And, you know, for me, I, I was, especially when I was you know, first starting in the business, not sure if that was the, a, a, a path I wanted to follow for the rest of my life. And, and I think I saw dedicating myself to, to being the best that I could be in the organization as some kind of uh, handcuff that would then hold me to that for the rest of my life. Um, it was like, oh man, well, if I'm really, if I put in the effort and I'm really good at it, what if I have to do this forever? Because yeah, I didn't <laughs> like what I was doing at the time. Right. And, and not really realizing that, you know, by putting in the effort, first of all, I got great pleasure from seeing the, the, the results of that hard work. And mm-hmm. that was, it was kind of like the inverse of how I expected things to go that, you know, I would be motivated and passionate about what I was doing. And, and then I would be, uh, you know, able to dedicate myself to doing it. And it was the opposite where I went, you know what, maybe I don't know if this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. But if I don't get out of bed on time to show up to work, that's just on me. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it was like, oh, wait a minute, I can do this. And, and oh, wait a minute, this is fun. You know, when, when you get to start seeing that uh, the effort that you're putting in is, is resulting in, in some really interesting and cool opportunities that, uh, that wouldn't have been there if I hadn't put, put the effort in. Yeah. All right. So if you fast forward, you know, you think in the future, what do you want your legacy as a leader to be? What do you want people to say about your leadership? I think if there's one thing I really keep coming back to, uh, when I think about, what I'm trying to build here, I want to be a great company to work for. I want to be a place where people are really satisfied in the work that they do. They feel empowered. Um, they're treated fairly. They're, they are given opportunities to learn and advance. Um, and I think being a great place to work is, is an ideal that, that is important to me. Um, because that's the environment I want to work in. I, you know, I want to come to work and work with people who are excited that uh, you know, the work that they do gets to make a difference and, and they feel like they're being heard and, and they feel like if they put that extra effort in, they're going to be rewarded for it. And uh, yeah, that's, that's something for me that um, I think is, is really a, an important part of what we are trying to do uh, with this company. Right on, man. Okay. Last question. And you know, all right. And there's, there's no rules here. (laughs) If you're thinking about anyone now who's come up in a legacy business, you know, like maybe like you, they had never thought they were going to work in it, or maybe they grew up working in it, but they're now going into taking the reins. Is there any advice or any thoughts that you'd give to someone who grew up in a family business and now is considering taking on the reins of leadership? Oh, definitely. One of the things that I have found the most helpful uh, is to build a network outside of the business. Um, I've jo- actually joined a group uh, called YPO, a Young Presidents Organization, and, and it's a resource for education and, and it's a network of uh, other presidents of organizations. And um, just having that opportunity to feel connected outside of my own business, you know, it's really important because the guidance that I was getting was, you know, in in the beginning of my career was really coming from both my 
father and my boss who happened to be the same person. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's really nice to be able to get outside of the business as well and exchange ideas with people who, uh, who have a totally different perspective mm -hmm. or who also may share some of those challenges of family business. You know, there's a lot of family businesses out there mm -hmm. and, People struggle with how to deal with, uh, you know, mixing family and work, and uh, it's not always easy. Um, but there are a lot of people out there who would be more than happy to uh, discuss their experiences, and I, and I would highly recommend finding a, a forum or, or some kind of group where, uh, where where you can connect outside of your business to uh, to learn. All right, man, I love it. Okay, I got one more question for All you. Right. It's not a business. It's not a business related question though. <laughs> So you grew up and you went to college in the in the in the Boston area, yes, correct? That is true. Top three Boston bands of all time. Oh, top three Boston bands of all time. Um, this is an impossibly hard question. I'm gonna go with maybe some less conventional choices because. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a little younger than you. I missed mm -hmm. kind of that first, uh, that first wave of, uh, of, you know, those bands like, uh, like SSD and Slapshot and like that, that was all a little bit before my time. So yeah, it's a little bit, how old do you think I am? It's I don't know, man. I, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like 19. I was in like elementary school. Well, you know, I just, for me, I, I grew up more in that scene where every Friday night was, we had one weekend would be kind of like a lock and out show. And the weekend mm -hmm. after that, it would be, you know, those bands like Hope, Conspiracy and Converge. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, I'm going to go top three. Oh man, this is a really long answer to a really short question, but uh, American Nightmare. Okay. That's number one. That's going to be my number three. Oh, number three. Okay. We're working our way up. Number three, American Nightmare. Number three is going to be American Nightmare. Number two, I'm going to put Mental just because that band meant so much to me. That was kind of like uh, when I was going to shows, I w was really into uh, those locking out bands. And, and those mm -hmm. guys were, uh, were some of my great friends uh, when I was in high school and university. Um, so that, that really meant a whole lot to me. And, and my number one Boston band, I think I'm going to go with Converge. Woo. Yeah, wow. I still listen to Converge like all the time, which I can't really say I, I listen to a whole lot of hardcore anymore. But uh, Converge is it gets heavy airplay for me, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to put them in at number one. Three great choices. I mean, American Nightmare for being American Nightmare, who they rule, totally awesome band. Mental, because you cannot escape how like Mental is just a great band. Very cool evolution. Really cool. They they just knew how to be a band and kind of have like. They were effortlessly cool, is what I'd say about uh, mental. In the, in the coolest of way, I mean that as nothing but a compliment. Definitely. You know, them, them locking out. And then Converge, like, I mean, one of the all-time greats. Those are great answers. Now, as I asked you this question, Patrick gave me an extremely disapproving look, not about your answers, but about my question. Oh, God. And shook his head back and forth and wrote on a piece of paper, the real kids, and <laughs> underlined it and held it up. That's because Patrick who's also from the punk scene and plays drums in an incredible band called Chain Whip. He's got really great musical taste, but also likes bands that would be a little bit outside what you and I would typically uh, go to. And also, you know, he's a little bit, a little bit of a pushy guy over here, pushing his opinions on into our podcast. You know, give us a little, little jab here. That's okay, though. So he wanted right, me listen. to say, like, Boston the band or something like that? Or? I don't know what he wanted. I mean, he was giving me this, like, stink eye. I can respect that, though. I, you know, Aerosmith I, I, is that uh, is that I where we're going with this? Was, I don't know what he was doing. You know, I, can respect, <laughs> I can respect his vibe. All right, listen. This was a great conversation, man. Thank you so much for joining us. And you know, I'd say for anyone uh, who's out there, whether you work in a company that's a family company or you're part of it because your family started the company, there's a whole idea here that when companies grow, they evolve, they they develop. All companies come from somewhere. A lot of companies started as family companies and then grew and changed and merged you know, through, through acquisitions. And all I got to say is this. Companies start from human beings. We all, you know, they all come from somewhere, and they're all full of stories of people trying to find their way, find out who they are as leaders, find out how do they continue to have that family feel while they evolve. And this was a great example of just such a human story of someone finding their way as a company finds its way. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you and reconnect with you, and uh, I was happy to be here, so uh, thank you again for the invitation. 
All right, my man. Thanks so much. And everybody, we will catch you in the outro. And Dave, drop the beat. Thanks, John Carlo, for an incredible conversation. You know, what really stood out for me there was the awareness of his position and how seriously he takes it. And I got to say, I, I really feel that that is common for people who grow up in a business. So, yeah, of course, there are these like ridiculous tropes. There are those people that like do act like buffoons. But again, I think they're the exception, not the rule. Most leaders that I've met who grow up in family businesses, just they realize the situation they're in and they want to do better. And sometimes they figure it out on their own. Other times they do it with help. So Giancarlo is a great example of someone who did a little bit of both, figured it out, stayed the course, and also has gotten some help to get better. Something that I encourage everyone to think of, whether or not you're in a family business or you're just, you know, working either on your own or in a normal organization. It's about being willing to see your own gaps and then take the steps to make sure that they're addressed. John Carlo is a great example of someone who has real humility. And just imagine if everyone was that willing to hold up the mirror to themselves and do the work what a different world we'd live in. So let's start with ourselves. So until next time, this has been One Step Beyond. One